front. And the simple reason is that the very way, the way the community life that we, we had when we were growing up, I mean, I was born in the 70s, so it's, it's a bit different. Our parents sometimes are not even as learned as many of us today when we are parenting. Many of us uh, went through parenting or we were, we were, we were raised uh, within, within a given social structure that reflected the times, that reflected the, the, um, the reality of that time, of that time. Now we are in the 21st century, and I, and I like the, 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 the caption under this, and it says parenting in the 21st century. The very first thing that distinguishes our time from that time is one, the ubiquity of information. In those days, for us to be able to get, maybe in my whole street, I think, maybe only two people had color television sets. And so for us to even watch TV, many of us have to, I'm sure you've seen some of those pictures online, where we go and stay behind a window, to be watching through a window, to a neighbor's house who has a TV set. Uh, many of us have also been, uh, many of us saw um, the computer for the very first time, maybe at our university level, when we were, when we were already in, at the higher, higher institute of higher learning. And so some things that are reality today would never be our reality. They were never our reality. The highest, let's talk about pornography. The highest we saw was Playboy magazine. I don't know if, who, who are those in the house that have seen Playboy in those days, you know? And it's, it's such a rare commodity that if you even get to see it, you're in the privileged class because who, are, who actually buys Playboy? You know, you must be in the middle class then to be able to see um, those kind of um, content. So the highest you see again was TV and the TV, the restriction was very, very great. It was not even paid TV. It was not like DSTV. It was not like, um, uh, you know, cable television. It was the NTA and the, um, maybe I grew up in Lagos, LTV or OGTV, Ogun State Television, those sort of government controlled uh, content. And so it was really not a common phenomenon to, to really stumble onto pornography. But in this day and age, if you use that mindset to follow this day and age, that is already the beginning of failure. Because right now, information is so accessible, it's so democratized. I can tell you that the things you will, the things you saw for the first time when you were 20 something, kids that are nine, eight years old have already seen it. That is the first reality. And so if our mindset does not change into the current reality of where information is, when I say information, let me use the word for a better word, content, where content, both good and bad content, you know, is readily available to any kind of person at any age, readily available. They may not be seeing it in your own house because uh, you are careful, because you're managing it. You, as a parent, you're conscious of this. But I tell you something, they see it everywhere else. On mobile phone, mobile phone these days are the biggest distributor of, of those kind of content. So with that reality, I think it is important for us as parents in this generation to understand that the times have changed. Now, in those days, my mother, my, we, we had only one girl. We had only... It, my, we, my, I have only one sister. You know, my mother could tell that my sister and say, listen, if a man touches you, you will get pregnant. That touch in that sense could be loaded. But my, and my sister could literally take it as a man physically touching her, you know, would lead to pregnancy. And they will do everything to avoid. And as such, um, but in these days, if you tell a girl that, an eight-year-old, you tell, tell her that, the person will look at you right in the face and tell you, what do you mean by that, mom? <laughs> you know, they would ask you the questions that you would never imagine. So the times have changed. That's what I'm trying to establish. And because the times have changed, the first thing I would say to, to I would say for me, and the learning that I have is that my attitude must change. My attitude towards parenting, my attitude towards connecting with my kids. I've heard many times they'll say, you, you should not be friends with your kids. Uh, because there should be a boundary and all of those sort of things. Otherwise, they will not get to you. I'm not so sure the psychology behind that, because the first thing that I learned was that as soon as I began to show that I am the parent, I am the, the, the boss, you should listen to me, right? In this day and age, the kids are already alienated. They see you, they, they, they view you with, a, with, with, with some kind of eyes. The eyes that this one doesn't know anything, you know? Let him talk after he has finished his backing in the house. Just right out the window from their mobile phone, everything that you've said, the opposite is what they are working on. 
that is one aspect. That is another reality. The exploratory minds of our kids today, the curiosity. I'm sure we are, if, if not all of us are parents, many of us have seen this in practical times. The kind of curiosity in the minds of our children today is not the type that you can afford to keep some information away. Keep it away from them and they will hear it and they will get it from other sources. And as such, these are the, this, this, these are the things that made me develop a very different attitude with my kids. And as such, the first thing that I thought was important, and that's why while they were growing up, before they began to get exposed or understand the difference, I, I again, I have a very strong religious background. It was to, it was to introduce them to my religion, and which is, again, I'm a Christian. So I basically introduced them to the God that I serve and to the principles that come with serving God, where basically they get to understand what is morally right and what is not morally right. And if you have such an environment, if the kids grow such an environment where you help establish some what you call basic values, basically you live by an example, you show them that you hold certain things at, at a very, um, certain things are very important for your life. For my kids, they know that without God, I don't exist. They hear it every day, they see it every day. They see how I take prayer. They see how I take my, my, my worship and going to church. So in their mind, certain things are a given. So that is one. That is number one. But the danger with that also is that when they get to, under, when, 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 when you become religious, I'm, I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to establish here the difference between being religious and being spiritual. So they understand, my, my kids understand from me that godliness or spiritual things are quite important for me as a parent and it's an establishment for the family and so between my wife and i we that is clear they know they, from from the day they were born they get to hear this every day so that is number one then but as we're going information that they get access to as they were growing up at eight at eight my son would ask me very solid questions when i said the, the question that my wife and i will look at ourselves like where did that come from? Very quest questions that are shocking, you know? Now, let me give you one shocking one as an example to illustrate this. My kids and I went on holiday in one of our family houses. There are two of them are boys. They had never seen, and I'm, I'm saying this for the first time, just for us to learn. They had never seen a female before. I mean, they've never been close with a female, like a female part a female private part. They've never seen it before. So, and in this place we went to visit, one of their uh, uh, cousins was urinating. You know, it's innocently, one of my boys went down, was looking. Like, what, what is that? Yours is different. That was very awkward, isn't it? And of course, the mom flared up. What are you doing? You know, and he was shocked himself that she, that one is different. Okay, yes, and that was when it dawned on us that these kids have actually never been close to the female gender. This was very early on, and then he showed that we be, we needed to have the conversation that two of you are boys. You have never been close. You've you've been. You've never seen how the female uh, body parts look like, that it is different. And this is what it looks like. This is why, and that this is why this is not proper because this is what it means. Early on, this is at, the, the kid was like maybe seven or six. So you will be shocked that at seven or six, he has never seen a female, you know, uh, uh, body parts or genitals before. He has never experienced it because two of them were boys. So now that was the first time we had to have a conversation about the opposite sex, what it looks like. So after all the calming down, after all the screaming first and coming down, you know, we began to, to, to have that conversation to say, listen, the female and the male is different. That's number one. And number two, these parts are called private, private parts. So you don't go looking as some other person's private part, because it is it is very rude, it is offensive, it is whatever. He was sober and he said he didn't know. He went to meet his cousin and said, I am sorry, 
I didn't know it was that. But that level of innocence could be broken beyond repair because it could actually mean something else. It could destroy that child psychologically. And so what, what my wife and I did was to sit down to say, what is the best way to approach this so that he also still has a healthy view of that. If we, one thing we need to tell ourselves all the time is never to assume that this will not happen or that I will kill him or I will kill her if I see this kind of thing. If you have that mindset, you're already beginning to alienate the kids already. That is from my own experience. So what is the result? What was the result of that? He came back and asked to say, so um, what is this? What is, what are, so how do I do it when, um, or I mean, how do I interact with a, with a female, you know, that does not allow, that is not rude. That is the word. Because we use the word that it was rude to be peering into a female private part at such an early age. Now, fast forward, my boy is 11. He's in England and he comes home and he tells me he was sad. He was so sad, he was actually sulking. And what is happening? He was quiet for a while. What is going on? He was quiet for a while. And then the next thing he tells me is that um, this person doesn't like me. And who is this person? He said, there's a girl in my class that I like very much, but she doesn't like me back. Yeah, another awkward one, isn't it? And so, you know, we talk about when you get a, a, a 10 year old or 11 year old will tell you I have a crush on somebody. So this is me, listen to this. And my, my wife and I was, and his elder brother, they are also there in the same school, was also there. And then I, we, we started laughing. My, my, my elder son and him started laughing. Hey, this guy is in love, this guy is in love, you know? When we did that, he was shy. He was like, no, it's not, I'm not in love, you know, those kind of thing. The reason why, the first reason why I did not like, what is that? You, so this is what you are doing in school. You know, that's where we were, you know, that's how we were, we were treated growing up. You can't tell your parents that the girl doesn't like you back. Where, where is that coming from? My father happened to be an ex soldier. That is, I still carry a scar around that I show myself to say, look, this was because I, I, it was written in my report card. It was too playful in class. That was what my teacher wrote in the comment section. I actually came first, but I, they wrote he was too playful in class. And I got some wire beating. What do you call wire? You know, wire beating. So, but here is my child telling me that the girl does not like him back and then he doesn't want to eat. <laughs> you know, it was crazy. But to get the things, to get the things in perspective, I had already, you know, tuned my mind that we are in a different generation. And that because he's 11 year old, um, you already began to see signs of puberty, even at 11. You already begin to see it. You already begin to see that this child is already growing pubic hair. So like it or not, testosterone is already flowing in that child. And they begin to think and feel like you as an adult is feeling. And if we do not live in the reality in that, and to understand that this is, this is real, then we take a different attitude. And that's my, that's for me was what I had learned much earlier. And so when we began to laugh with him and laugh at him for, for falling in love, you know, then we began to shift the conversation from that towards the more serious one. I'm like, okay, why do you think he doesn't like you? He said, I don't know. You know, we used to, used to like me, but I don't know what, what, what happened. I said, okay, so when you see the child, what, what happened? When you see her, what, what, what happens to you? I said, uh, you know, I just like her, you know? Okay, uh, butterflies in your stomach. I'm describing the feelings of lust, right? Or, or what do you call it, infatuation. So you feel butterfly, you always want to hang around. You always want to hold her hands. He said, yes, yes. I said, okay, do you know something? Do you know that if you come top in your class and you're the most smart in the class, everybody will like you, not only this girl, right? He said, really? I said, of course. I said, everybody likes a smart dude. Everybody wants a, want the coolest dude in the class. So if you focus on being the smartest guy in the class, 
you will get everybody to like you. It's not just her. It's that in fact, everybody will like you so much that she will be jealous. Okay. Now, point I'm making is this. I was trying to drag him away from his feelings to his studies, right? To make him see that studies were the most important thing for you right now. I was not trying to deny, to make him deny or excuse or disregard what he feels. But I was trying to get him to move his attention away from what he feels to what is what should be his priority at that time. But not in a way that is judgmental because the first thing that I've seen many parents do, and this, is, this comes mainly from those of us who have very strong religious background, is to, is, to, is to be shocked, that's the word. We are so shocked and we express the shock. And when you express the shock, many times that child doesn't ever come back to tell you anything. And you lose an opportunity of guiding that child in the direction that that child should be. So what am I saying in essence? I'm giving you my own experiences because much earlier, before now, I have come to the realization that times have changed and that the information that we were that was hoarded from us when we were growing up is easily available everywhere on the phone on the internet everywhere it's easily available and from that my attitude towards the kids changed already and the attitude for me is that i am not shocked when i see them when they say certain things or when they when they um, uh, talk about certain things and honestly the the result of this is that my kids are very free. They can tell me anything. Right now, they are not even in Nigeria, but the nearest opportunity they have, I'm the first person they call on the phone. Their mom is the first person they tell when they see something that is even strange. So I will end up with this last bit around pornography because I know that, uh, again, that is, that is one of the things. We, are, we live in a society where here not, the, the medium is not controlled. In, in the UK, for instance, now, the kids can't even access pornographic sites because as a matter of principle, um, every uh, service provider has actually blocked that first. So you have to get um, uh, permission, rather you have to show that you're above 18 to be able to have access to the networks to pornographic sites. So that is, that, that is good for outside here, but here they, they can access anything. Through any network, they can access anything. And what does that do to you? It, it exposes the kids in a way, even when they don't, you know, people send it even by WhatsApp to their phone, you know, they, they, they belong to a group or not even a group, their friends, they now do what they call sexting, right? They send uh, um, visuals that are really erotic, that are, that are, that are you know, um, what you call pornographic pictures, right? And when they see it, when they see you, they, they hide it, okay? And so I have seen on the phone, one of such images, you know, um, the first attitude was to hide it from me. And when, it, when, when I noticed that there was some kurukere behavior with the phone, I knew something was not in place, you know? And I broached the subject myself because I did not want it to look like I caught you or something like that, right? Because it can be awkward. So, but when I noticed certain, certain uh, behavior with, those kind of, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, content that is not healthy for the, for the kids at that age, right? I brought up the subject myself just to make them see that I'm not judging you, but you need to be able to know what to do with such things. And so when I said the first thing is, have you seen, you know, I've, I've, what would you do if somebody sends you a naked woman's picture, you know? And, you know, like, Ah, you know, those kind of pretentious, like, ah, you know, you know reaction like, um, no, that can't happen, you know? And I said, hey, I'm not saying that you looked for it, but say they send it to you. What would you do? You know? I said, no, I, I will warn them not to send it to me again. I said, really? Do you think if I check your phone now, you think I will not see that? You know? And the person goes quiet because they know that I would dare them. I would say, Okay, bring your phone. Let me check, right? And I said, but you know, sometimes you don't want this thing, but they just send it to you. Aha. So the, first of all, the, the first thing I want to say about that is that if you don't break the tension, if you don't break the wall, 
they also know that it is not proper. That is the truth. They know because of the way you have trained them and raised them, they also know that there is a boundary. They know what is not proper, but, it is, but they will get it anyway. And whether you are there or not, the most important thing for me as a parent is to make them see that is to understand the principle. And I began to speak to them to say, listen, you will get aroused unnecessarily because hey, the, the teenager is, is fully grown. Everything that I have, he has. Everything that I have, he has. And I said, listen, it will put you in a place where you will want to respond to your body needs. And this time around, there are consequences. It's not, it's not whether you like it or not. And I asked my son, Daniel, and I say, do you know you can get a girl pregnant? I say, ah, how, how? Say, but I'm telling you the truth. You can. And I said, if you get a girl pregnant, what do you think would happen? So no, that can never happen. I'm just saying, I'm just telling you. I didn't say it will happen, but I'm just, you will get her pregnant. Uh, I said, so you need to think about the things that make you think. about sex you are likely going to act on them and when you act on them there are consequences that is the first thing that is that is that was my first thing but what i tried not to do was to shame him was not to shame him to make him feel like oh you're such a terrible son or terrible child how could you you know get involved and they block them from me so ultimately what i'm saying is that this kind of Conversations should come with an on them to be in a way that would help them. First of all, they understand the consequences, they understand how it affects them, their psychology, and that they don't need to act on it unless they get um, unless they are misguided. So much time is that it's much stronger than the influence from inside the home when they are teenagers. And the, the ability to experiment is exponentially higher when they are teenagers. So if you are not the one they come to, to filter those information, I will only say, may God help us you know, to catch them. I want to leave it at that, then we can talk about this. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so much, Edwin. That has, in fact, I didn't even want it to stop, for, to be honest, because the 15 minutes has even gone and I didn't know about that. Thank you so, so much. Now we have set, well, 30 participants in the house. That's a huge one. If you have any question, what you would kindly do is kind, um, maybe drop the question in the chat box or raise up your hand, like the icon, with the icon hand, raise up your hand, then we can take your questions. Are we on the same page? So if you have any questions, just raise up your hand and we'll take your questions or type your question in the chat box, in the chat box, and then I'll take your questions. But since I'm the moderator, I think the onus is always on me to ask the first question first one or two questions. So while I'm waiting for your questions, your contributions, your suggestions, it's an interactive session. So if you faced um, this kind of situations before, maybe as a parent or as someone who has influence over children, as a teacher, as a church leader, please, we would really um, want you to speak up. So my question for you, Edwin, is if after you've done all of this, and you've tried to break the wall, you're not judging the child, but you notice repeat actions. The actions don't stop. So it's repeated. Maybe you've not been in that situation, but what would you think? What do you think um, we can do about that? What can be done about it? How can that be approached? Okay. Um Thank you. I'm not, I'm not going to be prescriptive again. I would say that each, each family is different and each reality is different. So it may not be exactly, um, we, we don't have the same thing. I would, I would only say that, first of all, um, the, the child's value system comes from the family value system. 
then the child can choose to walk outside of the family value system that the child has grown up with. So that is possible. Now, the first, my, my point is, I will always have bring my kids back to the reference point. Not because um, they would, um, you, know, I, you know, sorry, not because I think they want to, they want to rebel, but because I also, I would, I would assume that one, they, they are, uh, sorry, first, first of all, they are, they, are, they, are, they are allowed, they are getting information and they are not able to use it effectively. Now, if I have done my best to try to make sure that they, have, they are getting, using that information effectively that they are having or exposure to, but it's leading to some kind of behavior that is, that is consistent, of course, as a parent, again, I'm I I am a Bible believer, Bible believing Christian. So, uh, spare the spare the rod and spoil the child. It's still very much in my game, you know. So, the kind of privileges you would express your, I mean, what I've done is express my displeasure in a very in very solid terms, you know. I don't want to go into the, the debate of should you beat your child or not beat your child and all of that. In very solid terms, to for the child to know that. This is outside the values that we have. Consequences is and in any way that is, is appropriate for the extent of that fact. Okay, can you hear me?
the level of ambition in your child is also very is a critical factor here. For my boy, I've always told him he wants to go to Imperial College, right? He wants to do software engineering. He wants to be Bill Gates. He wants to be everything. So I bring that again in front of him. Say these kind of conversations it will not make you get close to these goals. You know, so there has to be something that they look forward to. And then you are able to tune those conversations towards those goals, those aspirations as well. So there is that part that they, they will see the role that such conversations. 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 Okay, is that sorted now? Yes, it is. So my, my point is that when you will connect, if you say, don't join this group again or, or remove from that group, there, is a, there are two ways. The child could be afraid of you and not do it while you are there and then go back and do it, right? Or the child could, 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 could um, one, outrightly rebel to say, hey, you know, it's my life, especially when you are in the system where you are not allowed to even shout on your child, right? The child could tell you, it's my life. I don't, I don't, you know, I will do whatever, whatever I want to do. I'm 16, for instance, right? But I think the most important thing is when the kid understands the impact of such conversation, one, on their life's ambition, on their aspirations, on the family values, and how it is making them to think outside of those family values, what it could lead to the impact of such. If the child understands that the child is able to make that decision, one mistake that I've seen parents do all the time is to assume that this child does not have any agency at all, and that this child is stupid, and that if you don't kill this child, if you don't beat the child, the child will never know what to do right. As much as that is that could be true, it's important for us to know that You're not being wise with, with this with these uh, steps you are taking. I don't know if that makes sense, but others can as well um, uh, join in. Okay. Okay. We have favor but they ask your question, make your contribution. Two hands are actually in. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Can you okay. hear me? Good Hello. evening, everyone. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Oh. Anti, yeah. Andy Funke, can 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 you can you come in as well? Anti Funke, are you are you here? Okay, it looks like it looks like she has dropped off. Um, so, um, Tendani, can you do you want do you want to say anything about this? Ah, in fact, I was just raising my hand to ask if I may um, speak. Um, thank you very much. So, I'm sharing from a point of view of being a young parent, but I want to let you guys know that I was a teenage mother. So I fell pregnant when I was 16. So there's a little bit of my own pain. Of this action, of, 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 of staying with this action for a long time and how it can be addictive. You know, please, I, I, I'm saying this. If you have been a victim of it, don't be ashamed to tell your child 
that have been a victim of this. Because they will, they will relate more, you know, when they, when they can see, when they can understand that this thing is not far-fetched, it's not, in, it's not theory, it is practical, it is real. Many of us I know, and, and, and I'm saying this with all humility, many of us don't feel, don't want to be ever vulnerable in presence of our children. We shield them, we protect them from certain things because we think, no, they, should, they shouldn't know this about me. That is one of the biggest disservice we can have with our children. But if we are also vulnerable, if you have been a victim, when I, I use the word victim, no, no, no. If you have been a, um, victim is not the right word. If you have been involved and you know how it damaged you, share it with your child. This did not help me. I used to be caught in this. That is the first thing I wanted to, I wanted to just communicate that. And that's the reason why I also wanted, um, you know, other thoughts to come in because from my perspective, I use myself as an example. My kids see me for who I am. I don't pretend to them. And when they have seen that it has happened, it need not happen to you. It doesn't have to. You know, alcoholism too can be, can be that. If you see your, if you met your child drinking, or even smoking. Or even smoking. And those, those things that you thought you would perceive as bad behavior, and they don't see anything with it because it is the coolest thing in town. Everybody is doing it. In fact, if you are not doing it, you are not cool, right? So how do you communicate? How do you cut through? How do you get them to see that this is real? And I, and I always say this, please, don't be ashamed to use yourself as an example, please especially when you're dealing with talking about consequences because they can relate. But if you are giving examples from outside far and all of those, uh, there's something I always tell my son to say, hey, do you know, I, I make some examples to say, you know the fastest way for a king to fall. And you know, they are very current too. Jeffrey Epstein, I, I put it there, I say it is women, it is girls, right? They've seen, they, they know this story. They are very current with this news. That are making that are trending. So I make example with the trend that look, this is how this Bill Clinton, I, I always do the case, and they've seen the they've seen the memes, they've mm. seen the memes. He was president, right? But this is how he came down. This is that this was the only bad character. This is the only thing that stained his presidency. You know, it, those kind of those kind of conversations are important for them to see that if this makes you gets you addicted and you find expressions in, in illicit sex. This is, these are the kind of consequence, it can bring you down. Those sort yeah. of conversations. Can okay, thank you. Um, I think Tendani is in, but before she goes on, Glory's hand has been up for a while. So Glory, go on and unmute yourself. We have very limited time, but we'll just try to take all the conversations. Glory. Okay, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, that's a very good um, analysis, Mr. Edwin. Thank you very much. Um, I listened through it and I could relate to it because I have boys as well. Um, but thankfully, I just had I just have a girl now, so I'm trying to get used to the the girlship. And I like the fact that I actually have a mini me. So because the boys wahala is too much, and that's the truth. Um, I'll speak from the perspective of um, uh, an educator. Now, I'm in a school where, or well, I've been in schools, a lot of schools, and of course there are children that are between the ages of, I'm talking about primary school now, ages between um, five to about nine, 10 years old. And just as you've said, this is like the age where they are beginning to develop you know, and try to understand their feelings, they get confused and they ask themselves questions. Now they're asking themselves questions. You find out that they can't really, like you said, speak to their parents because they may have created this thing that has made it unable for them to be able to relate with their parents on that level. So now they look for, okay, who is on that same level with them? And then they try to relate with that person. Now, um, sometimes when I used to be in the classroom, I would, in the morning, I come to school in the morning, 
and I have like a seven year old has already written me a love letter on my table. I, I, I have that a lot. And then you see things like, oh, your nails are as bright as the sun. Your smile is this, these days. You're that, that, that. I'm not joking. So sometimes I'm in shock when I see. So I, I just freeze and I try to understand, okay, what am I going to do to this? How am I going to respond to this? And then you see the child bold enough to come and ask me for his reply. So, you know, sometimes we've had to call parents in to have conversations with them. What beats me is the fact that we're not raised like that. So it, it, it pains me that this generation, I don't know what they're doing with the children. I don't know at all. You know, growing up, it was like the community or everybody is raising one child. It was in a community where or we're in a place where if I did something wrong, my mom is not there. I have someone that is there that can tell me this thing is not right or can even beat me or strike me if need be. And when my mom comes back, she will even be appreciative about it. Now, what we have is we have parents that don't touch my children. Don't even look in their direction. Don't even try to correct them. I will do the correction myself. That's what we have now. Now, then they also forget how they grew up and they don't pass down the same family values like you've talked about. I've seen it happen a lot of times. And then at what age should parents begin to talk about sex education to their children? Because a lot of them shy away from that responsibility. They don't even want to talk about it. They act like it's not there, but it is there. So why act as if it is not in existence? And at the end of the day, you feel, you see children getting abused because they're trying to experiment. You see them trying to get answers from different sources. You know, so for me as a, as a like as a, um, someone in school, I've always told parents, if you're scared or you're shy to talk about it, let's meet as a school and then we agree on, okay, what extent of knowledge do you want the student to have at this level? so that the school is speaking the same language as the parents at home. Because you, you can't come and tell your child that, oh, a baby came from the mouth. A, a child was given birth by the mouth. When you know that it is not the mouth. And then in school, they are learning something different. It is from maybe the bomb or it's from another place. So you have conflicts of opinions. And then the children are now, okay, let us find out where this thing is actually coming from. So I don't know how we want to create that awareness. We need to create the awareness that parents need to understand these things. Because at the end of the day, it comes back to the school. It's the school that has the problem. It's the school that is not teaching the children what they're supposed to know. Which means giving the school the responsibility of the family, of the home. So I don't know if we can actually have a big campaign. I don't know how, like big campaign, no, because it is terrible. It is terrible, even between children, you know. Now, I had, I'm sorry, Kila. Let me just share one experience with you. Last week, I, I had uh, seven-year-olds. Um, they were having conversations. I just heard them whispering into each other's ears and everything. I just kept quiet. I was just observing. I didn't, I acted like I wasn't even aware of what was yeah. going on. And after a while, you know, it was like, oh, you, let's tell her, let's tell her, let's tell her, let's tell her. So I said, okay, what are you telling me? So apparently, one of the girls allowed a boy in the class kiss her outside. So of course, I didn't, I didn't treat it like it was a big deal. Like, well, what did you do? What happened? This is it. So it was, it was okay. You know that there is coronavirus. Do you know if this person has coronavirus? Do you know if this boy brushed his teeth this morning? You're a girl. Do you want to get dental you know, cavities? You know those kind of things. So when you begin to instigate that kind of fear, oh, maybe by next week your teeth could be rotting. You will lose all your teeth from kissing this boy. Like, honestly, all of a sudden she was like, Ma, can I go outside and vomit? I said, why do you want to vomit? You are kissing. Don't you want to kiss again? Do you understand? Yes. So that kind of a child, by the time you begin to talk, 
that child will not want to do it. If the, if the child sees that boy, she probably want to pass another route. You understand? So that's just my two cents. But I think we need to do something more. Like, you know how Absolutely. you have to complain about something. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Glory. Wow. We usually try to stay under one hour, and we've done above one hour, and I'm still getting questions, hands raised. What do we do? What do we what what should we do? Okay, so let me take Tendani is back, and I feel yeah, like yeah. she needs to complete that what she was trying to say. So please, Tendani, could you just unmute yourself, please, and just go quick, quick, quickly, please. I forgot and even what I wanted to say, but I think that the most important points have been covered. You know, whether you are living in Africa, like in Nigeria or even in South Africa, I think that the essence is that we're losing the essence of who we are, which is the spirit of Ubuntu. Mem Glory just touched on it mm -hmm. about how a society or community used to raise our children. But the world has changed, as Edwin said. I had educated parents. My mother was actually a healthcare service provider. But I think that we were not friends. And I'm not trying to blame my parents for, my, for the mistakes that I made, but what I'm trying to articulate is that I could identify with what Edwin was saying because when kids do not have guidance or friends um, who are their parents or even their aunties, they go outside to find comfort, advice, and guidance. So um, mom flavor, favor, I, I heard you. And what I would advise to you is that, you know, I really now believe in the saying that you have to treat people the way that you, you want them to become. I know that trust has been broken between you and your son, but I would advise that in addition to prayer, you sit down with them and you tell them that you trust them and more and like tell them, like start confessing what you, you want him to be right and because it's so hard to disappoint people that believe in you and people that trust you and they keep confessing it but we need to to somehow do get back to that whole spirit of of ubuntu where we show we also model as parents that your uncle will definitely discipline you your neighbor will discipline you because it's us who are putting up our walls and then our neighbors are just gonna let our kids do what they want to do Today, I'm a better parent because I can apply some of the things that I was yearning for and I can identify with my kids because we are friends. We can say, hey, like, you know, you, this peer pressure, which we started talking about, like from as early as like my, my daughter was in um, the second class in primary school because kids want to fit in. They want to hang with the with the hip group and you need to teach them from early on that what's hip it's what we determine for ourselves and when you say no it's actually a a sign of strength right mm -hmm. please invite me to your next gatherings definitely <laughs> thank you just thank just um before, before you before you before you drop that i mean i i want i'd like us to take this this is very important you know the more you confess um the level of trust you have I know Emeka is on here. I think I saw his I saw his iPhone. You know, when when you treat your child like you are responsible, right? They 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 also feel the responsibility. I don't know how to, I'm trying to communicate something here. If they, they know that you trust them, they, not just trust, they know that you believe in them. That's not that's the word I'm looking for. Not 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 necessarily trust, they know that you believe in them. And that that belief that you can, I can allow you. Can, I'm allowing you to do this because I believe you will not make a wrong decision. I believe you know what is right and what is not right. Peer pressures will make them do certain things. They will see other things. They will get again glory. The part, the fact is that a seven-year-old kissing and and sending you love letters. The source is the source is too many. It's not like our time. There is what we call democratization of information right now, good and bad. So we have a role of helping them see 
And I think that the last thing that Ndani said that was so important, he says, we determine what is hip, what is cool. My, my, my boy wants to do braids now. He wants to, he wants to braid, you know? And I like, why do you want to braid? He said, it's cool, you know? And I asked him, have you seen Obama braid? You know, I, I, it's, it, this, this is a conversation. So what do you aspire? Do you want to be Lil Wayne or do you want to be Obama? You know, those, those sort of things. So there are, there are things, there are kinds of conversations that you use to establish values that enable them also now begin to reassess. Okay, this thing is going towards Lil Wayne. This one is going towards Obama, right? And then you can, you can then they can begin to see. You don't have to tell them and lecture, lecture, lecture. Lecture doesn't work in this generation. I'm sorry, but that's, that's my own experience. Thank you. Please, I, I, I yield it back to you. Thank you so much. It has been an awesome session today. Please, I want to beg, can we end tonight's session? I'm still seeing hands raised. I don't know what to do. <laughs> it's already more than one hour. And I'd like to really, really keep it on an hour. But here's what we can do. You have questions, please send them to WhatsApp, to the WhatsApp group. Uh, send it to me on WhatsApp where you got the link from. And I'll forward them to uh, Mr. Edwin. I also forward to Tendani. I think I have a number as well. And the conversation will keep going. This is a recorded session. Unfortunately, we had that break, but I'm sure we were able to get a chunk of it. And it'll be uploaded. And you can replay, rewatch, and share with um, people in your network. This has been an amazing session. Remember that Parent Connect podcast is brought to you by Early Flight Academy. Early Flight Academy is an organization that's committed to raising Africa's next generation of entrepreneurs, change makers, leaders, innovators, by exposing them to skills, trainings that they don't get ordinarily within the, the uh, conventional educational system. So things like leadership, things like entrepreneurship, different things, technical trainings as well, IT and all of that. So thank you, everybody. And I will send the replay link to you. It has been an amazing time. So you can all unmute yourself and just say good night to everyone. And thank you so much, Edwin. It was really fun having you here tonight. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you, thank you Mom, Tendani. Thank you. Thank you. This is so awesome. Of your Thank heart. you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Really awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.